You know, I wish more companies were like Minis Forum because they take some ideas and then just go crazy with it and they experiment and they are not afraid to do weird stuff. A lot of the other companies are like, all right, we've got our parts here. We're going to make laptops and mini PCs and tablets and we're going to make them just like everybody else makes them to not be weird. And Minis Forum's like, yeah, yeah, we'll make a mini PC, but we're going to add Oculink here. And then we're going to make another mini PC and this one's going to have PCI Express and a few other things and a bunch of NICs on the back, 10 gig Ethernet and a bunch of USB 4 so you can run networking at home and then they're like you know what these mini pcs are so fast with these laptop cpus these low power cpus what if we made them into motherboards and they made a mini itx motherboard that i love and now we have a slightly larger motherboard right here this is the bd 795m how do you feel about having the cpu integrated into a motherboard no socket just cpu integrated how do you feel about that all right let me know in the comments I use OEM keys for a few different reasons. This is the price you're going to pay for Windows 11 Pro. If you get a retail key, let's check those prices on whokeys.com. $30, no, we can do better. Put in TS25, click apply. There we go, 2322. Let's say you want to get a copy of Windows 10 Pro. Also have Windows 10 Pro, and right now that key still unlocks Windows 11. You can get Windows 10 Home, Windows 11 Home, and we have two flavors of Office. If you're sick of paying that monthly subscription, well, you can get yourself an offline version of Office 2019 or Office 2016. The other thing is OEM keys are generally locked to your hardware. So if you move it from one motherboard to another, you may need to get another key, but you'll have to get many, many, many keys to equal the price of one retail key. Let's go ahead and check out with our copy of Windows 11 Pro. All right, just put in my card info. There we go. Click on View Keys and Codes. Once you get to the User Center, click on Get the Key. You'll see your key right here in the middle. Go ahead and highlight that, copy that, press Start, and then type Activate. You'll see Activation Settings. Go ahead and click on that. And then right here it says Not Active. Just click on Change Product Key. Place in our product key and then click on Activate. Hey, look at that. Active. Head over to whokeys.com. Thanks to them for sponsoring. And now on to our regularly scheduled program. If the spec list here meets your needs, this might be better than getting a desktop part. There are a few things that I think for me are kind of key and they're missing, but if you don't need those few things, namely USB 4 and USB Type-C, if you don't need those things and you don't need extra PCI Express and you want like a lot of speed, this is extremely interesting. The BD795M is special because it has an integrated Ryzen 9 7945 HX. Now let's compare that to, I don't have one of these on, on hand. All right, when you look at the test online, it's about 90% as fast as the desktop 7950X. So it's kind of ridiculous. And over here you can see it's got very similar clock speeds actually a little bit faster on the clock speed up to 5.4 the base clock's 2.5 and you've got you know same l3 cache 64 megabytes of cache but the default tdp is 55 watts now this thing can pull more than that it can pull up to 75 depending on how it's configured the desktop part is going to be pulling about 175 watts even when it's idle it's going to be pulling like 30 to 40 watts when the 7945 hx is idling it's only going to be pulling 5 watts way more efficient and i think it's awesome to be able to have that in a desktop flavor so let me get this out of the way right in the beginning a lot of people are going to say like okay so i've got the c CPU attached to the motherboard. So if either one of those goes bad, I've got to replace the entire thing. And yes, that is true. And I do say that about a lot of integrated parts. However, when you compare it to what you can get over here, it's less expensive than just the CPU. So that kind of makes that entire argument moot. Like, you know, this is less expensive than the CPU. You get the motherboard and the CPU that's 90% as fast in multi-core. The single core is like 95% as fast. And also for some gaming tests, I, I don't have one of the 90, 7950Xs to test right here. I wish I did so I could try this, but in the gaming tests, I'm anticipating them being pretty much identical because the frequency advantage of the 7945HX is there. Oh, look, they even have the Cinebench score right here. I was, <laughs> I saw it somewhere else and it's on their website. What do you know? Let me just talk about the rest of the features on the motherboard and then we'll do a full on tour. So you've got metal reinforcements all around for a lot of the brackets. Uh, the PCI Express bracket has metal reinforcement and I don't know what it was, but I pulled a GPU out of another um, system just to mess just to test out the bracket and everything and it was a little bit tight but i finally got it in there after a few minutes but it was difficult to get it in there at first and i thought it was my case but i don't think so 
So you do have that reinforced bracket, but maybe I just needed to fidget with it or something. I don't know. There's our little internal GPU. I say little because that's what it is. It's just something to get you by. If you need to play 3D games and stuff, just put something in the PCI Express slot. This is Micro ATX, and uh, there's a lot of room on this board. A lot of room that's not used for much else. Their previous motherboard came with an integrated heatsink, and that makes the shipping weight a little bit heavier, and you know it gives you fewer options. I kind of like the fact that you can install your own heatsink on this one. It uses Intel 1170 socket heat sinks, which is interesting for an AMD part. Now I'm just using this, this here. That's the Thermalrite Assassin X. It's like a $19 cooler and it's really quiet. And you know, this is not a part that you're going to be overclocking. So there's water cooling options. I don't know why anybody would do that because you don't need to overclock. And as long as it stays within spec, you're going to be wasting your money and resources unless you want to just make something that looks cool. That's a, that's viable. Sure. Takes DDR5 memory, 5200 mega transfers and um, it'll use up to 96 gigabytes. You only have two slots there though. All right, so let's take a full tour here. We're gonna start up at the top left and just work our way all around. Up here, we've got our first system fan. We've got plenty of fan options in this, so you can just have a nice wind tunnel going. CPU fan up here, I've got, well, there's the eight pin power connector. Got some heat sinks on top of the V-Regs here, nothing too extreme because you don't need anything too extreme for a board like this. Then we've got our CPU fan and then our AIO pump to the socket there and it's already populated with that CPU. And then on top of that, we've got a nice big heat sink, some copper right there in the middle. And then you'll just need to mount your 1170 coolers. A lot of weird things going on here. And we've got our V-Regs right there with another heatsink on top of those. Nothing too extreme, just some fins. Now let's go all the way up here to the top. These traces, they go way up here to a USB 3.2 front panel header. No USB-C, but you can get an adapter for that. And I have one, so you can put a like, USB-C adapter on there if you need it. Then we've got empty space, just nothingness right here. Just, this is the nothing, just PCB silicon. And right here we have SO dims. I mean, they could have probably fit some full-size dims right here, but we have 5200 speed SO dims. That's what it says it'll take, why not? And then over here we have our, just our power connector right there to the power supply. Then we've got two SATA connectors right there. Kind of interesting, finally got some SATA on these. Then a lot of just, again, not much going on here, just empty space. There's our battery for our CMOS. There's our front panel connector and then nothing vast nothingness right there. We've got two more system fan headers. Then we have USB 2.0 header and a front panel audio connector right there. Above that, we have our 16 speed shielded, as you can see, or a little, you know, they've added some rigidity to this. And our 16 speed PCI Express slot. And then we have two PCI Express Gen 4 right there. Those two M.2. And then our little smaller port for Wi-Fi over there. That could probably be you know, repurposed for something else if you don't want to use the Wi-Fi. So I think the theme here for me is that, okay, we've got some interesting options and a lot of empty space. For a micro ATX board, we only have one PCI Express when generally you can see two or even three PCI Express, but how many people use that? Maybe, I don't know, five out of every 100 will populate more than one. So they've done that instead. And I think having two M.2 is probably a good idea. Now, when it comes to other USB and stuff, there's no USB-C. So what year is it? I, I think that's a little weird, but if you're using this for like industrial or for rendering or something, maybe you don't need USB-C. So none of that on board. And again, like I said, you can use an adapter, but it's not gonna be USB 4 or anything like that. You'll be limited to USB 3 something, 3.1, 3.2, whatever your adapter will do, or you can just use the 3.2 header right there. I don't think I've ever seen a board like this with so much empty space. You could probably fit most of this into a, you know, like an ITX board, not super comfortably and not with maybe so many fan headers and stuff, but I think you could get about 95% of this into a smaller motherboard without much trouble, especially since we're using SO DIMMs and not full size, uh, you know, full size DDR4, DDR5 slots or whatever. On the back here, also what I would call interesting. Let's start over here from the left. We have a right there, CMOS reset. And then beside that, we have HDMI and DisplayPort full size right there, those two connections. Then we have some USB 3.2 Gen 1 headers. And we've got two of those, they're both type A. And then we've got some USB 2 headers. We have our Ethernet, 2.5 gigabit Ethernet right there. It's the Realtek RTL 8125. I've never had any trouble with these. And then we have audio, just three ports. So again, there's not too much going on back here and no USB-C and no USB 4.0, which I do find a little bit weird because there's plenty of room for it. They could have put more USB back here, but I guess they're expecting you to either not use that much when it comes to like this, whatever you're gonna be doing. So 
yeah, it's, this is what you get. If you don't need USB 4, if you're not gonna be running any external hubs and you don't need that many plugs, this could be perfect. So it could be the perfect board for you if your you know, needs are met by this. All right, for a bit of fun, do a little bit of a comparison. I wanted to show you what you can fit on a micro ATX motherboard using a motherboard I just have just sitting around here. All right, so this is the Steel Legend from ASRock, and this is a premium motherboard from the AM4 era. I haven't used this one yet. I've just had it sitting around. You've got four RAM slots, full size. So just for reference, this is a loaded micro ATX motherboard. It's the B550M Steel Legend from ASRock. And as you can see, it's got everything. It's got extra PCI Express slots. You've got six SATA ports. You've got all kinds of USB options. It's completely loaded. And this thing was expensive when it first came out. And that's kind of the point here. Every single thing you add is going to add more money. So how much do you need? Nobody's going to be using all this. It's nice to have in case you do need it and for future expansion options or just being able to like, change things around. But realistically, I think maybe 3% of the people used more than 30 or 40 percent of all this we're just throwing out random numbers here if you're just joining us so you just got to ask yourself how much do you need this is obviously overkill but there comes a point when it becomes underkill so yeah all right so let's talk about gaming now without having to install a pci express graphics card sure you can play all kinds of indie games i've been playing this one i'm going to recommend it right now if you're someone who likes dark souls and hyper light drifter and you wish they had a baby well here you go get out of here oh how do you roll there we go i forgot <laughs> so i just started this and it feels i mean for me maybe too much like dark souls but if you like that kind of game and you wish that it was like more like hyper light drifter or whatever and you like the movement and everything in hyper light drifter then this can be a pretty good pretty good game for you so anyway check out fountains it even has these sort of like messages that you get from people or whatever like they're little ghosts of messages just like you know elden ring dark souls whatever so yeah uh sweet valuable yes cool uh, i'm gonna vote it uh good i want to play another game here it's a 2.5d game it's really a 3d game that people call 2.5d because of the graphics but this is anno mutationum one of my favorite indie games in the last few years and it plays really, really well on the high settings here at 1080p. So yeah, you can game on this. I just wouldn't play like the AAA, you know, shooters and first person games and these really uh, over the top games that are and some of these new modern ultra realistic games. I probably wouldn't play those, but a game like this is going to run just fine. So yeah, you can play a lot of your indie games, a lot of your older games. And if you want to play like the, the crazy newest flashiest games we'll just grab a gpu and throw it in there if you need me i'll be in the club i think this is prophecy all right so let's take a look at valley we're using that integrated 610m so i'm not expecting anything crazy but here's what we got on 1080p high 20.9 fps score of 875 with a minimum of 15.2 let's take a look at superposition because that incorporates the cpu quite a bit for all those physics computations but still a lot of 3d so on 1080p medium we got an average of 10.46 fps overall score 1398 and you can see our minimum right there, 8.85. All right, pass mark. I want you to look at everything right here. 3D graphics and everything. Look at that. Pretty low, but look at the CPU. This is where we're going to see the big numbers, the CPU. So I'll go through some of this. I'm just going to show these things on the screen. So if you want to like run these tests at home just to see how much faster this low power CPU is than your CPU and then cry, go ahead. There's our CPU mark score <laughs> way over there. 2D mark, oh, that's pretty good. 3D mark, I don't know. And then memory mark, I'm just running some crucial memory that I had sitting around here. And disk mark, I'm running a PCI Express Gen 3, so ignore that. So really the story is here, the CPU is a beast. Speaking of CPU being a beast, let's take a look at the single core score here on Cinebench R23, 1954. It's so ridiculous to me that this is like way faster than my current 5950X in my big rig, especially when you take a look at the multi-core score. It's so fast. It's so fast for something under 100 watts. Kind of insane. Multi-core 33,290. Single core 1954. Let's try out Geekbench as well. So our single core score 2937 and our multi-core score is 16444. I'm going to scroll down here so you can see all of the detailed results. If there's certain tests that you like really, really, really need or really need to know. So just go ahead and pause it or whatever. All right, there's all the tests. OpenCL 5512. And again, I'll scroll down so you can see all the individual tests to see what matters to you. 
A to 64 right here, and we're gonna run the stress test. I'm gonna let this run for like, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes and come back and just see how it's doing. There we go, this is what's on the inside right now. Use one of these because this is $19. And I wanna see if this can do a good job at keeping this, you know, like super crazy CPU in check. Because if it can, then that's all we need. All right, so it has been a little over, well, 17 minutes. And I let it go a little bit longer because I wanted to see what was going on. It kind of goes up and down a little bit, but it stays right around the high 70s. And uh, it got to 81.8 degrees C. That was the high. But most of the time it's around 77, 78, 76, somewhere in this range. And it just kind of like goes up and down and up and down. The fans are really quiet on this unit. So yes, with an $18 or $19 CPU cooler, I'm able to stay completely within spec. I am totally happy with this. So yeah doing a good job all right so the real thing for me is that i do think it's weird that it's been you know micro atx instead of an itx because i've seen this much stuff crammed onto an itx board but it's fine it, i kind of like having the extra room to move around and it was much easier to build with you know they're not having to like smash things together so uh, so closely. M.2 that's right above the graphics card slot. If you have a big heat spreader on there, it is right up next to the graphics card. That's not too big of a deal, but it's like if you have a big heat spreader, it might touch the edge of the GPU bracket or the GPU um, slot, PCI Express slot. I don't think it will. The mine's very close and I have a big beefy, you know, cooling unit on my M.2 with one extra PCI Express slot and USB 4 on the back. I would literally consider upgrading my main rig because it's that fast and that quiet and that low power. You know, it literally runs circles around my 5950X and that's, that's weird to me because that's a big beefy CPU that uses a lot of power. Bottom line is if this meets your needs, don't f even think twice about it being all one thing on the same board, in my opinion. The fact that it's, like I said earlier, you know, cheaper than just a CPU that's very competitive. So it's very, I, I don't know why AMD doesn't sell stuff like this or doesn't i don't know i guess it's because it's not socketed it's all integrated but i don't know why we don't see more of this and i think it's cool that minis forum is doing this and i want more of it because first i was like i don't like the integrated stuff but it, if it's going to be this price where it's you know it's going to cost me substantially more to buy a motherboard and a cpu with another platform or a regular desktop platform then sure it's fine it's great as long as it's got all the ports and stuff i need which it doesn't but if it did That'd be amazing. And if it does for you, awesome. I think I, I envy you. I wish my needs were in line with yours so I could upgrade to it. All right, let me know what you all think of this Minis Forum motherboard. Let me know in the comments. I'm very curious, actually. Mm -hmm.